What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. I am Nicholas, and this is Big Dogs Gotta Eat. BDGE Fantasy Football. Happy Monday. I hope you guys uh, had a great start to your week. I hope I am a reason why the, the start of your week is fantastic. For those of y'all that have been joining me every single Monday, every single day throughout the summer so far, I love y'all. I love you for the support. I appreciate every thumbs up, comment, every negative comment as well, man. All that stuff. It all goes right here. Today, we're going to be talking about my top breakout running backs for the 2019 fantasy football season. Over the last few years, we've seen, you know, we've seen the data, we've seen the trends, and now we're seeing with all these holdouts and the teams not wanting to pay players that the NFL running back position is replaceable to a level, right? We see that the jump from one guy to their backup is not necessarily that big of a jump in terms of the production you're going to get. However, we've seen a, a plethora of talent at the running back position just keep replenishing itself year over year in the draft. And over the last couple of years, we've seen so many starting running backs that are today's starting running backs come out just in the last year, two years, three years. It keeps replenishing itself. And we have new guys breaking out every single season. That's what we're going to talk about today. These guys are on the cusp of dominating their backfield and they're about to dominate your 2019 fantasy football season. So let's get into the video. I want to give away a draft guide. I'm probably going to do this every single Monday. So if you don't know, Big Dogs BDGE creates a draft guide. All of the most valuable content that we put out throughout the summer is packaged up into a draft guide. BigDogsDraftGuide.com. I want to give one away. Here's what we're going to do. You have to, one, follow all the social medias. I don't know what their link either up there or down there. Two, thumbs up on the video. Drop a comment. If you had to bet the mortgage, you had a gun to your head and someone's going to pull the trigger. If who you predict to be your top breakout running back does not come to fruition, who are you choosing? I want you to drop down below who your number one breakout running back candidate is for the 2019 fantasy football season and why. If you want to win a draft guide, that is the way to do it. Thumbs up, comment your breakout running back, go follow on the social medias, and I will choose someone for next video. Let's jump into the first running back on the list. This is Mr. Carry On. Carry On will continue to carry on his dominance into the 2019 season. The big news that came out last week was the fact that Theo Riddick was released by the Lions. I wasn't surprised. So I think Theo Riddick has a possibility of getting cut. I know he signed that like lifetime contract with Detroit and it seems like he's been there forever. But if they cut him, I think they lose less than a million dollars, maybe 800,000 in cap space, which is obviously nothing to nothing. these NFL teams. Thus, my bold take would be that carry on moves up into the second round as a fantasy player. Woo. But I'll be honest, I'm kind of pissed about this because I was smashing the cop button on carry on Johnson at the late third round of every single best draft that I was in. I've literally done over 115 to 125 best ball drafts already. And yes, I know I'm a psycho. We already, I feel like we already knew this. Carry on is my most owned running back. Riddick getting cut is going to, you know, similar to what I predicted in that previous video, spike carry on Johnson's ADP really, really, really high. I think he'll be a borderline second round pick by the time drafts actually roll around. We have to look at the situation that we find ourselves in. The first concern on a lot of people's minds is probably carry on Johnson's health. Dating back to college, Carry on has seen his fair share of injuries back at his time at Auburn. He injured his shoulder in 2015, which led to shoulder surgery in 2016, plus a bunch of other minor injuries throughout the rest of <coughs> the rest of his time. Hamstring, ankle sprain, retweaking that shoulder. Nothing really major, but still banged up consistently. In his rookie season, he was on his way to a breakout campaign, right? We started seeing them feed him the rock. Johnson ended up limping off the field in week 11, which ironically made me limp a little bit down below because I own carry on Johnson in, uh, in a majority of my leagues. He suffered a knee injury. We never got exact confirmation, I don't believe, from what the knee injury was, but Dr. Morse, friend of the show, who is doing injury write-ups on every injury-relevant player in the draft guide, another feature of the draft guide, which you can check out on BigDogDraftGuide.com, he said, likely he suffered a sprain to one of the supporting knee ligaments, probably the MCL, as that is the most common in football. So the plan was to let him rest for three to four weeks, which is what you do with an injury like that, and then reassess him. They ended up shutting him down for the rest of the season. And my suspicion, along with most people, is that he was probably fine after the four weeks. But by week 15, Detroit was five and nine. That was a record and they were out of playoff contention. So there's no reason to push him and put him at risk for a more serious injury, an ACL tear, and have him miss the entire 2019 season. So it wasn't that serious of an injury. But again, it was just another bullet point in the list of injuries that he's dealt with so far. Johnson has since been cleared. He's been a full participant in OTAs and in training camp and whatever. And we're hearing that he's dominating 
at training camp, especially in the pass catching department, which I believe would have easily been the case regardless of whether or not Theo Riddick got cut. But now Riddick's releasing, by God, is going to open up tons of targets, tons of receptions to this backfield. We're seeing these reports. The Athletics' Chris Burke believes Karyon Johnson can catch 50-plus passes. Detroit Free Press predicts Karyon Johnson will catch at least 60 passes. So I don't really care about those random beat reporters throwing out numbers because they have no idea what they're doing with statistics. But it just goes to show that they're watching the plays and they're seeing a lot of plays being drawn up to, sh- to throw the ball to Karyon Johnson. Or Matt Stafford is relying on Karyon Johnson as like his outlet. We're talking a lot about the pass catching. We know that Karyon Johnson has a three-down skill set. So what happens on early downs? Last year, he was second in the NFL in yards per carry, 5.4 yards per carry, seventh in yards after contact, 3.3 yards after contact on average, 10th overall in evaded tackles per attempt. So he was getting the yards. He was able to produce after defenders were in his face. He was making them miss and he was getting yards after the fact that they were swarming him in the backfield. So he was very, very good all around. So what actually happened here in Detroit? Let's let's go Picasso. Let's go full fucking Picasso because that's what we do here. We drop the big facts. And if you're enjoying the big facts, make sure you hit that thumbs up button down below at some point during the video. Let's paint the picture. Before the injury, Karrion Johnson was just starting to warm up. From weeks one to five, Karrion Johnson did not play on over 50% of the Detroit's offensive snaps in any of their games. You see 23, 47, 45, 37, 47. He was just a piece, a cog in this backfield. They had their bye in week six, and I'm spitballing here, but maybe, just maybe, they realized, hey, at this point in the season, maybe the carry split between Karrion Johnson and LeGarrette Blunt should not be 50 to 47, because that's what it was at this point. Karrion Johnson at that point had a 5.7 yards per carry mark, which is a little bit higher than LeGarrette Blunt's 2.7 yards per carry. Incredible analytics department that Detroit must have there in order to make that switch and start using Karrion Johnson a little bit more. Karrion Johnson gets inserted as the dominant back in Detroit from week 7 to 11, which is a five-game si- sample size before Karrion Johnson hurts his knee. He played on over 50% of the snaps in every single one of his games before injuring that knee. In those five games, Karrion Johnson averaged exactly 100 yards from scrimmage, but most importantly was averaging nearly five targets and four receptions per game. He also scored three touchdowns in those five games. Who knows what would happen if Karrion Johnson stayed healthy? He could have possibly been a league winner in 2018 fantasy football leagues. Now looking forward to 2019, we know that Karrion Johnson is a great talent, right? We've already established this. But what kind of offense is this going to be? That is the question mark number two. We have health and we have Detroit as an offense. They could very well just be a shitty offense under Matt Patricia. We know offensive lines can make or break a running back, right? That was one of the exclusive articles in the draft guide that Noah wrote up about going into the year where your offensive line ranked and what are the chances that you finish as a top 10 fantasy back. Go check that out on BigDogDraftGuide.com. Last year, Detroit was Pro Football Focus's 11th best run blocking line in the NFL. They have a young group up front anchored by their first round pick last year, Frank Ragnow at center. We know the interior or the offensive line is very important to running backs. I mean, the tackles are obviously more swayed towards protecting the quarterback because the edge rushers are what brings pressure and collapses the pocket. But interior is big, and that is where they've been slowly building up. And that's what they've been investing in over the last few years, Detroit has, right? They really want to shore up that up front. So I love the continuity, having a young offensive line and getting better year over year. This offense overall, though, they bring in Daryl Bevel as the offensive coordinator. Bevel was the OC in Minnesota from 2006 to 2010, and then in Seattle from 2011 through 2017. His first year ever as offensive coordinator in 26, 2006, excuse me, His RB1 was fantasy's running back 14. After that, eight straight seasons of his running back one being the RB6 in fantasy or better. Eight straight seasons. And then you can see the fall off over the last three years, 2015, 2016, 2017. Those were in Seattle, but that was where Beast Mode, you know, retired. They were just seeing a carousel of running backs being the RB1 because you'd have a guy who played for three games, get hurt. Then the next guy would step up for four games, get hurt. So you never get an overall finish of someone high up in the fantasy running back rankings. In his 12 years as the offense coordinator, the average running back one saw 250 carries per season. If you take out the last three years in Seattle, where I said it was just a carousel of running backs, we're looking at the RB1 getting 299 carries per season. Obviously, you add in targets and receptions, and you're probably looking at closer to 340, 350 touches for the running back one. You can absolutely make the chicken or the egg argument, considering that he coached Adrian Peterson in Minnesota and then Marshawn Lynch in Seattle. It's like, oh, they were just so good. You had to feed him the ball. 
But it also tells you that if he has a guy that's really good, he's not afraid to feed him the workhorse role and the workhorse touches. And he's not just going to force a running back by committee for the sake of doing it. And let's not forget about the scoring opportunities for what Karrion Johnson might have in 2019. LeGarrette Blunt had 17 carries inside the 10-yard line last year. 11 goal line carries, which was good for top 12 among NFL running backs last year. It's ridiculous. Karrion Johnson, two goal line carries last year. How much did Matt Patricia's hiring sway the philosophy in Detroit, especially near the end zone? If you check out these numbers, 2016 and 2017, prior to Matt Patricia coming over, 56% of the time inside the opponent's 10-yard line, they were passing the ball. That jumped up to 59% in 2017, which was the eighth and seventh highest rates in the NFL. You can see there by the chart, which you could find on sharpfootballstats.com. Matt Patricia enters Detroit's offense. In 2018, their pass rate inside the 10-yard line, 36%, 29th in the NFL, which means they were running the ball a lot more down there. Now with LeGarrette Blunt out, if Karen Johnson is getting those goal line touches. I don't know how often Detroit's offense is actually going to be down there, but I expect even if you think CJ Anderson might plug in as that meatball Garrett Blunt role and get some of those thick touches down there, I still think Karen Johnson probably gets, you know, 50 percent if not higher of those goal line carries so I think the touchdown opportunity is actually also there and we're probably not looking at that at a high enough rate so I love Karen Johnson for a breakout 2019 fantasy football season I will pref or what's the opposite of preface you preface you post this I will post face this with saying the injury history paired alongside with the fact that Detroit's offense could possibly be ineffective as a whole you're a team that wants a ground and pound that's not effective in today's NFL it's going to eat up a lot of clock which could be good because on Johnson, that means Karrion Johnson is going to get a lot of touches. I'd say Karrion Johnson is a fantastic third round pick if you get him as your RB2. It's very risky to go into the RB1 range and get him in the second round. So I'd probably be off that. But third round where his value currently is, is absolutely fantastic. Speaking of drafting, grabbing these guys in certain rounds. I showed you before on draft.com that uh, Karen Johnson is my highest owned running back this year. If you want to draft with me, I open up drafts throughout the week all the time. Go to draft.com or sign up on the Draft app, which you can get on iOS, you can get on Google, or wherever weird kind of phones y'all have. If you sign up on Draft.com and you use my promo code BDGE, they will give you $3 to draft with. If you have not started prepping or mock drafting for your drafts, this is definitely the best platform to do so. They are best ball drafts, but all of the ADPs are very accurate because you're joining $1 drafts. Obviously, you could win money. If you're going into the paid drafts, the top three places win money. You don't have to make any in-season moves, so you don't have to worry about with the roster and trades and waiver wire. It's literally just drafting. So prep yourself, go to draft.com, use the promo code BDGE. When you sign up, you'll get $3 to draft with. Running back number two, Aaron Jones of the Green Bay Packers. He is currently the 16th running back off the board, 30th overall. I will I will preface, I'm using this correctly now, I will preface this by saying Aaron Jones is currently dealing with a hamstring injury, which is very concerning. We hate hamstring injuries here because they linger. If you come back too early, you're going to re-injure it. You're going to re-injure it. I'm going to talk about this under the assumption that they let him rest for a few weeks and he comes back 100% healthy. If that changes over the next few weeks, I'm filming this on August 2nd. So obviously, if you're watching this on like August 21st and something changes, I apologize. Jones is a guy, admittedly, that I actually didn't love going into the summer, right? I initially started looking at this Green Bay backfield, and we know historically that they just keep using these running back by committees, at least over the last few years. And that's what I thought. I was like, running back by committee, stay away, stay away, stay away. And then I started thinking, let's look at this from a different angle. Aaron Jones is a guy whose concerns are twofold, running back by committee and injury history. What would make that injury proneness, the injury rating risk for Aaron Jones go down if he's actually used in a running back by committee effectively? And I've made this point a few times over the last few weeks. If Green Bay can start using Aaron Jones in that Alvin Kamara role, that would be incredible. Less frequently in terms of volume, in terms of those carries inside the 20s and getting banged up in the middle of runs and stuff, Use him more in the pass catching game. And that's exactly what they want to do. Matt LaFleur comes over from Tennessee to head coach this Green Bay team, right? And we know the background of LaFleur coached under Kyle Shanahan in Atlanta. He coached under Sean McVay in LA for the Rams. Now, last year was not a good year whatsoever for Matt LaFleur in Tennessee. Say what you want about the quarterback situation, but when you look at the actual offense overall, in terms of like snaps, in terms of pace of play, time between plays, it wasn't good. It was not forward thinking. I will say that that is a little bit nerve wracking because you would like to have seen him implement more of the up pace, up tempo style of play that he learned under Shanahan. 
Shanahan and McVay. We'll see in the preseason what that offense actually looks like. What is really encouraging is just what we're hearing from Green Bay camp and how much he wants to get the running backs in space and involved in the passing game. I love it when we can give running backs the ball in the passing game. That's one more eligible that the defense really has to focus in on. If we could use Aaron Jones like we did Deion Lewis last year, that would be incredible, right? Deion Lewis caught 59 passes last year. That's a huge number. And I think we can all agree that at worst, Aaron Jones is the best pass catcher in this Green Bay backfield. They have Dexter Williams and they have Jamal Williams. Both of those are pure early down grinder runners and it's not close. So Aaron Jones is the fit for the pass catching role, which we saw Deion Lewis flourish. And I know you want to say like, oh, he realized that there was one back at the end of the year that could do it. But Deion Lewis was still catching like three passes per game, even when Derrick Henry went on his crazy run at the end of last year. So at minimum, he's the pass catcher. But I think we could all probably agree that Aaron Jones is by far and away the best runner in this backfield as well. He led the entire NFL in yards per carry last year while ranking eighth in tackles evaded per attempt. Unlike Deion Lewis, Aaron Jones is not competing with Derrick Henry. I don't think Derrick Henry is particularly great, but as pure runners, Jamal Williams and Dexter Williams are like the dominoes to Derrick Henry's L&B Spumoni Garden. The problem is we don't actually know what the Green Bay coaches prefer, right? Maybe there's some drunk college kids that like dominoes and they smash that cop button at 2 a.m. on Friday mornings, but we can all objectively agree that L&B, their pizza is far superior than Domino's is, but there's a time and place. We're not always fading Domino's. Unfortunately, they've enjoyed the greasy ass Jamal Williams for far too long and needs to stop. And it sucks that Aaron Jones suffered the hamstring injury because Jamal Williams is also dealing with a hamstring injury. He's been sidelined for a long time. For a little while, a week or two, they were getting to see Aaron Jones with the first team only exclusively and really showing what he had. All reports out of camp were that he was doing great, but now him and Jamal Williams are both sidelined with these hamstring injuries. I'm completely fine letting, you know, one of the fat Williams brothers soak up those early down carries so it leads to less work for Aaron Jones, the work that's not valuable for fantasy anyways. Two yard carries, three yard carries, four yard carries up the middle. If he has a large percent of the touches in this offense, in this backfield, which I expect that to happen, this is going to be a high powered offense that scores a lot of touchdowns and is in the goal, in the red zone area at a high rate. Man, I would love for Aaron Jones to get 12 to 14 carries a game, five to six targets a game. Man, you could sign me up for a 17 to 18 touch Aaron Jones over a 25 touch Aaron Jones who's probably going to get hurt in like three to four weeks, seven out of seven days per week. And this is also a very good offensive line that he's going to be running behind. They were football outsiders, seventh ranked run blocking line and PFF's fifth best ranked run blocking line last year. They drafted a kid named Elkton Jenkins from Mississippi State. I believe it was 44th overall, which ensures that offensive, the interior offensive line is, you know, healthy at all times. At least they have depth if something were to happen. They signed Billy Turner through free agency, former Denver Bronco, four-year, $28 million contract. They hired former 49ers O-line coach Adam Stenovich. So LaFleur and Stenovich will be on the same Kyle Shanahan-esque page. They both worked under him and understand how to use that offensive line in this scheme. So this is going to be all around a great offensive unit in Green Bay. They're going to be hitting on all cylinders, in my opinion. So the scoring opportunities, again, should be there. Jones is a terrific goal line red zone rusher. I don't think enough people give him credit for this because of his smaller stature, right? His smaller size. But a lot of guys that succeed down in that area are actually smaller because they have great vision and balance and can get into the end zone, even if there are guys all around them, right? Those quick twitch muscles are equally, if not more important than the actual size of the runner, even dating back to his days in college, which I think is a big teller of whether or not you're good at scoring touchdowns, especially on the goal line. He ran for 33 rushing touchdowns in 35 college games last year. He handled 67% of the Packers goal line carries and was absolutely dominant inside the 10 yard line. I went back and looked at all the NFL running backs last year that had at least eight carries inside the 10 yard line. Aaron Jones had the single highest touchdown rate. He had eight carries inside the 10 yard line, scored six times, 75%. He was so far above the other ones. It's actually kind of crazy. So it's a small sample size, but super efficient. And that number I just can't get off my mind is the 59 receptions by Deion Lewis. If Jones even flirts with that number, given the rushing upside that he has, you know, compared to Deion Lewis, plus this offense is going to be way better than Tennessee's offense last year. I'm starting to love the idea of Aaron Jones, even in a committee, which might not even be the case. He might end up being the workhorse here. So Aaron Jones, again, love him in the third round, definitely risking the second round, have to monitor that hamstring injury. But if he is healthy, he's absolutely going to break out in 2019. Wow, I just realized that all three of these backs are in the NFC South or the uh, NFC North. David Montgomery of the Chicago Bears. Rookie, 
Rookie, rookie, rookie. Give me Demon over Josh Jacobs all day and tomorrow. I'm starting to buy into David Montgomery really, really, really strongly. I love his fit from a three down standpoint in the Chicago Bears, Matt Nagy offense. Cohen is obviously going to take some snaps, but if you look at the numbers, first of all, all reports out of camp are that like Cohen is going to lose touches because David Montgomery and Mike Davis both fit that three down role way better than a guy like Jordan Howard did last year. Cohen played on 46% of the Bears offensive snaps last year. And of that 46%, he played outside, out wide as a receiver or from the slot on nearly 35% of those. That re realistically leaves about 70 to 75% of the snaps coming from the backfield open between Montgomery and Mike Davis. Even on plays that Cohen is in the backfield, they can use both running backs on the field, both David Montgomery and Terry Cohen. I expect to see a lot of that. I think Montgomery plays like 65 to 75% of the snaps in 2018, and he will contribute much more in the passing game than Jordan Howard did last year, right? And to give you a frame of reference, Joe Mixon played on 70% of the snaps last year. Melvin Gordon, 72% if you take out when he left in week 12 as well, so no bias there. Kamara plays on 66% of the plays. Most backs nowadays play, you know, those borderline high-end RB2s, the low RB1s play on about 60 to 65% of the snaps. So if Montgomery's seeing that type of workload or that type of play volume, I'm all in on this guy. Jordan Howard caught 20 passes last year and still finishes a top 20 fantasy running back. Montgomery should hit that easily. And something I did talk about, and if you've been watching my videos, you've seen, you've seen this chart and you've seen me point this out multiple times, is that pre-draft, I said it was very important for him to land on an offense that runs from the shotgun often. And this is for a few reasons, because similar to Le'Veon Bell, Montgomery can dance, man. He's got those moves, but he has very little burst to, to shoot through the offensive line. So he's not going to break off huge runs. Guys that have that long speed and that burst, they tremendously benefit from running under center because they have those two to three extra steps, right? The quarterback has to drop back in order to hand them the ball when they're getting that handoff to burst through the hole that's there. So they need the burst in order to really succeed. From the shotgun, a guy with vision and agility like Montgomery who can move laterally and side to side, you get the ball with no running start. You just get to sidestep the first guy or sidestep to the hole that you want and then pick your hole. That's where he'll excel. So is the Bears offense a good fit? If, if you've been looking at this chart, obviously, yes. They run 79% of their plays from the shotgun, which was the second highest rate in the entire NFL. And they ran the ball while they were in shotgun at the third highest rate in the NFL, 33%. So that is great news for Montgomery. So they bring in Mike Davis prior to the NFL draft. Two years, $8 million. But now Montgomery comes in, and I believe he will take over that role pretty pretty much immediately, right? He is similarly built to Davis in both size and play style. But he's much better in the passing game than a Jordan Howard. And I would say that both of them can contribute in the passing game. Mike Davis showed that he has you know passing game chops while he was in Seattle last year. I think that's why the Bears took him, though. So they don't want to have to rely on Tariq Cohen to be the passing down back. It just makes sense from an NFL philosophy. You don't want to have a guy either in Tariq Cohen and Jordan Howard who are so different ends of the spectrum in terms of defense preparing for them, right? So if Tariq Cohen's on the field, you're like, he's not going to run the ball up the middle. If Jordan Howard's on the field, you're like, they have to run the ball up the middle because he can't really do anything else. So I'm excited for David Montgomery to contribute in a large way in both the passing and the running game this year. It gets cold in Chicago, man, towards the end of the year when they're playing that hard-nosed NFC North football, 20-degree weather. That's when we saw Jordan Howard start really turning it on towards the end of last year. David Montgomery is going to be that guy. So given his size, given his skill set, I think he fits into this Matt Nagy offense beautifully. And there's a reason they went out and picked him because they know that he was going to contribute off the rip. So those are my three favorite breakout running back candidates right now. A couple other honorable mentions. I've talked about Rashad Penny pretty endlessly at this point. I still think Chris Car. I don't think Penny just beats out Chris Car Carson on a talent talent standpoint. I do think that they're going to go with a full running back by committee. Penny is much more set up to be the pass passing down back. If they use him that way, that's going to be super valuable. There's a lot of touches up for grabs with Mike Davis out of there now. Um, I think Penny probably has a workload floor of 190 to 200 touches if he stays healthy. Chris Carson's obviously battled a lot of injuries throughout his career, dating all the way back to high school where he tore his ACL his senior year. So there are a lot of outs in order for Penny to really emerge in an offense that gives the ball to their running backs at, at the highest rate in the NFL. So I like Penny. I do think something has to happen to Carson um, in order for him to take over that really like three down workhorse role. But I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever if we look back and like Rashad Penny ends up as a top 15 fantasy running back. Next guy on this list, another rookie running back, Miles Sanders. Absolutely love him. He left practice for like a second yesterday or last week, if you're watching this, with a foot injury. Supposedly it wasn't significant because he went back out and 
played more on it, but they are going to take x-rays. So by the time you're watching this video, we've probably heard a little bit more about Miles Sanders. I do think he starts the year in a full running back by committee with Jordan Howard. I think by halfway through the year, though, we might be looking at it like a Marlon Mack situation or like even like a carry on where you see him starting to take over that role slowly. And then maybe 2020, we're like, yeah, Miles Sanders is on the precipice of a monster breakout. So those are honorable mention guys. Again, if you want to win a draft guide, drop down below in the comment section and don't forget to hit that thumbs up button while you're down there. Drop down below who your number one breakout running back candidate is. He's got, if he's gone over a thousand yards from scrimmage already, and I'm going to sound like an asshole if Aaron Jones has already done that. I don't think he has, but drop your number one breakout running back candidate for 2019 fantasy football down below. And I will choose someone who I think had a, a good comment or at least good logic behind it. Uh, to win a draft guide and I will probably announce that I will announce that on next Monday's video so um, thank you for joining me as always check out bigdogdraftguide.com if you want all the big facts hit that thumbs up button comment and I will see y'all on tomorrow's video bye